Good morning, Christ is in our midst. I'm Father Kevin Long of St. Elias, St. York, and Orthodox Church in Newcastle, Pennsylvania. Today is Wednesday, June 3rd, and here are the readings for today. The first reading is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 23, verses 1 through 11. In those days, Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived before God in all good conscience up to this day. And Ananias, the high priest, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God shall strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet, contrary to the Lord, you order me to be dis to be struck? And those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. But when Paul perceived that one, of the, that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee a son of Pharisees, with respect to the hope and to the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose in the Pharisees and the Sadducees. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn in pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and to bring him into the barracks. The following night the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified about me at Jerusalem, so, must, so you must bear witness also at Rome. The Gospel today is from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, verses 15 through 23. The Lord said to his disciples, All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will see me no more. Again a little while, and you will see me. Some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us, A little while, and you will see me, and again a little while, and you will... And, I'm sorry... A little while you will not see me, and again a little while you will see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he means. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, A little while, and you will not see me, and again a little while, and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, you will leap, weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is in travail, she has sorrow, because her hour is come. But when she is delivered of the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being is born into the world. So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask anything of the Father, he will give it to you in my name. The readings from the Gospel of John that we've been having during the course of this week have been taken directly from the very same reading that we do on Holy Thursday night, the very long first reading of the Twelve Gospels. So this is a time, because the Twelve Gospels is the time that we remember the crucifixion of our Lord and all the things that led up to it. So even here we have this lead up, even though he's being very theological and even though um, he's saying the great theology of the Gospel of John, which we hold on to through the Council of Nicaea, he's still right at the very precipice, right at the very threshold of being betrayed and then mocked, scourged, beaten, humiliated, judged, and then ultimately crucified. So he's saying all of these things with a degree of urgency, and he's also trying to say plainly the things that he had said obliquely, the things that he had said through parables, the things he hadn't said at all but had rather had done. Um, now he's trying to make very clear who he is so his disciples understand. And so that when they do behold him crucified or they do behold him in the tomb, they realize that that's not the end and that he will indeed rise from the dead because he continues to do the complete and... and um, beautiful will of the Father. And he says a number of things in this passage. You know, There is always that concern, and it's concern that the disciples had after his ascension also 
about what they're going to do because he's not there anymore. So how do they respond? How do they live? What do they do? And so he's trying to give them words of consolation that will assure them that he will come back. Now, he says, very shortly, you won't see me. And then very shortly after that, you will see me. And how interesting as he continues to go, he says to them, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You can think of all the people that mocked and, and ridiculed Christ while he was on the cross. It's as if the world had won, which is, of course, um, not true, but it certainly appears that way at the very um, beginnings of his crucifixion. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is in travail, she has sorrow because her hour has come. Now there he's referring to a woman who's about to give birth and how painful that is. But when she is delivered of the child, our Lord says, she no longer remembers the anguish for that a human being is born into the world. It is amazing how, um, you know, things like giving birth and, and other pain, travail kinds of things, you know, that are specifically painful during the course of what's happening. Um, the pain sort of washes away over time and it becomes such that, um, you know, the, the pain goes away because there's this gift that's given uh, to the world in the form of a baby boy or a baby girl. So our Lord is basically saying that the three days when he is in the tomb or actually in Hades destroying death by death, the disciples and those who love Christ will be in sorrow. They will be mourning and they will be weeping. But that bitterness will turn into great joy because through the crucifixion, life has come into all the world. So you have sorrow now, our Lord says, but now I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. That's an important thing for us to remember also. When we are a people of faith, when we really hold on steadfastly to our faith, and we hold true what our Lord has said and promised to us, there's absolutely nothing the world can do that can take that joy away from us. The only way that joy can be taken away is if we allow it to be taken from us. He continues on, In that day you will ask nothing of me, because at this point we see very clearly that the, that the Trinity is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Son is a completely accomplished the things that he was set out to do. And so at this point, we have that direct conduit to the Father. And that's exactly what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, if ask anything of the Father, he will give it to you in my name. Let's remember a couple of things. The one prayer that we've been taught to pray is our Lord's prayer. Well, our Lord's prayer is to the Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Not, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, our God, um, hallowed be thy name. We don't say that. O oh Son, we don't say that. O oh Holy Spirit, we don't say that. It is directly addressed to the Father because the enmity between us and the Father, the estrangement between us and God, has been destroyed through Christ's incarnation. So it's truly beautiful and truly miraculous for us. If you ask anything of the Father, he will give it to you in my name. Let me be very clear about something here. That doesn't mean if you give prayer to the Father and say, let me win today at the casino, or let something happen where I prevail and someone else suffers. That's not, um, that's not what he's talking about. Because what he is talking about, are having the grace or the strength sufficient to accomplish the will of God in this world. Okay, It's not just Christ who's out to accomplish the will of the Father. All of us need to accomplish the will of the Father in that we are to love God with everything that we have, you know, no, nothing left behind, and then also to love our neighbors as ourselves. And these are our great tasks that we've been given. Everything else, both in the Old and the New Testament, point back to those two things. And so the requests that we make of the Father need to be in compliance with that particular framework. It's not that God will give you power over someone else so that you can have a political position and they can't or so that they 
you know, suffer the same kind of adverse conditions that you do or anything like that. Anything that you pray, you need to pray in accordance with what is, God, what is God's will. So may God bless you and keep you today and always. I pray that you and your family will be well today and always. And God willing, we will meet again very soon. Christ is in our midst. Have a great day.